the National Broadcasting Company presents, transcribes, Sir Lawrence Olivier in Theatre Royal. This is Lawrence Olivier. Today's play is based upon one of my own most favorite stories, written by an author who in his day foretold many of the miracles which today we treat as commonplace, H.G. Wells. This particular story deals, like so many of his others, with the world of his imagination. I shall play the part of Nunez, the man who tells the story. Here, then, is H.G. Wells, The Country of the Blind. <laughs> Three hundred miles and more from Kimborazo, one hundred from the snows of Cotopaxi, in the wildest wastes of the Ecuador Andes, there lies that mysterious mountain valley cut off from the world of men, the country of the blind. Long years ago, that valley had been accessible. Indeed, it had been settled and farmed by Peruvians who had fled there from the tyranny of their Spanish ruler. But then, in the 17th century, a violent volcanic eruption had brought down one whole side of Mount Arauca. The landslide had completely cut off the valley from the outside world. And ever since that day, the country of the blind had been no more than a legend. The legend was known to me, and I told it to the party of mountaineers to which I was acting as a guide in the attempt to climb Parascatopotel the so-called Matterhorn of the Andes. And you say the valley is somewhere down there? Mm, somewhere. Nobody remembers exactly where it lies. Nobody's been there for nearly 300 years. But why the country of the blind? One survivor of the original settlers escaped. He was out of the valley when the earthquake occurred. He said that the valley had everything that man could desire. Sweet water, pasture, good climate. The settlers had done very well there, despite the height and the wildness of the mountains that hemmed them in. But a strange disease had broken out and made all the children born there blind. Mm. It was to seek some antidote or charm against this that he had left the valley and made his way down to the coastal belt. He had come down to the coast to fetch some holy relics for his people by which they might be cured. Then, after the earthquake, of course, he was unable to get back to his people. He died in the silver mine. And the story he had brought back to the coast became a legend. Mm, quite a pretty one. Mm. I dare say his people had contracted snow blindness. If it's as bad down there as it is up here. <laughs> oh, I don't think they had any snow to bother about. The valley must be several thousand feet below us, down there, under the mist, somewhere. The climate was supposed to be very temperate. Well, that's more than I can say for this ridge. <laughs> perhaps the mist will clear in the morning and we'll get a sight of the place. Mm, perhaps so. The peak seems to act as a sort of cloud trap, cleared on this side of the ridge, misty on the other. Are there supposed to be people still living there? Oh, according to the legend, yes. Nobody knows, as nobody's ever been there since. Hmm, we might try and get down there, after we've uh, made the summit. <laughs> no chance of that, I'm afraid. Beyond the ridge, there's a sheer precipice, a thousand feet or more. Nobody knows what lies below that. Oh, well, I'm going to turn in. <laughs> we've got a stiff day ahead of us. Well, good night, senor. I'll just have a word with the porters before I turn in, too. Watch how you go near the ridge. <laughs> right. Snow's a bit loose, I noticed. Good night. Good night. Our camp was at the foot of the last leg of the climb, on a sheltering shelf of rock just over the ridge by which we had come up. I checked our equipment with the porters and went on 20 or 30 yards to the edge. It was bright moonlight, and below me the clouds lay silent as a vast and glittering snow field. Suddenly I felt a tremor in the hard snow under my feet. I, I jumped back, I slipped, and I felt myself falling, falling over the sheer edge of the shell. Ah! shelf to the ridge and beyond it down the sheer white slopes the loosened snow thundering along beneath me 
down the slope to the precipice, then falling, falling through space till I lost all consciousness. Down further slopes till at last the avalanche came to rest, miraculously leaving me only half buried in the soft white snow that had saved my life. How long I lay there insensible, I can only guess. But at last I came to my senses and struggled free. Bruised, but otherwise unhurt, I staggered down beyond the snow line, dropped beside a boulder, and fell into a stunned sleep. When I awoke, it was broad daylight, and the birds were singing in the trees below me. I dragged myself to my feet and gazed about me. Behind the sheer white wall of the mountain towered up to the clouds. There was no hope of climbing back to safety that way. My only hope was to go on, down by the screes and quarries to the trees, down through them to the hidden valley. The climb might be difficult, but at least it was possible. <laughs> day I had reached the valley floor. About me were green fields, carefully cultivated in little walled-in patches. And there before me were clustered the huts of a village. Hello there. Hi. Three men were there beyond the stream. When I shouted, they turned and peered in my direction. I waved to them. They did not appear to see me. They turned towards the mountains Hello. Hello. and shouted away to my right. I scrambled down towards the little bridge which led into the village, and when at last they could hear me approaching, they turned their blank and sightless faces towards me, and then I knew. This was the country of the blind. All the old stories and legends came back to me, and as I came toward them, the proverb came into my mind, in the country of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. My name is Nunez. Jose Nunez, the guide from Bogota, beyond the mountains. I fell with an avalanche from the ridge up there. It's a miracle I wasn't killed. Where did he come from, Brother Pedro? Down out of the rocks. <laughs> from over the mountains, the country beyond there, where men can see. You can't see me, I know, but I can see you all right. I come from near Bogota, where nobody has lost their sight. Lost their sight? <laughs> what is sight? Let me feel you, stranger. Uh, yeah. Let me feel your face. Uh, well, why are you afraid to be felt? Well, yeah, well, mind my eyes, um, carefully. Eyes? He's a strange creature. You feel the coarseness of his hair like a llama's. Mm. And the roughness of his chin. Oh, rough as the rocks that begot him. Oh, well, well, perhaps he will grow fine. Uh, carefully, uh, don't prod my eyes like he that. He speaks, he, certainly he is a man. And you have come into the world. <laughs> Out of the world? Mm -hmm. Over mountains and glaciers, right over there. The world beyond the mountains. The real world that goes down 12 days' journey to the sea. Mm. Let us take him to the elders. This is a marvelous thing. Uh, take my hand. Take your hand, but I tell you, I can see. See? Eh, see. I can see perfectly well, and it's quite... A... Oh, sorry, but I... <laughs> His senses are still imperfect. He stumbles and talks unmeaning words. Lead him by the hand. Uh, look, just because I trip over a pail that you leave in the way, it doesn't mean... Oh, very well. Take my hand, then. I found it taxed my nerves and patience more than I'd anticipated that first encounter with the population of the country of the blind. As we entered the village, the people came out of every cottage, mud huts with never a window among them, held on to me, touching me, smelling at me, listening to every word I said. And I could make none of them understand that I came from the great world beyond the mountains and that I had eyes and could see. At last, I was told to wait outside the hut of the elders while my two blind guides explained all about me. Then I was told to enter. Inside, the hut was as black as night. I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry, it's so dark, I can't see. I, I fell over somebody, I'm afraid. Dark? I'm sorry. See? What does he mean? As we said, he's a wild man out of the rocks. Bogota. Bogota, over the mountain. His mind is hardly formed yet. He's only the beginnings of speech. He is called Bogota, and he is but newly formed. As you hear, he stumbles as he walks and uh, mingles words that mean nothing with his speech. Once again, I find myself trying to explain the great world out of which I had fallen, and the sky, and the sun, and such like marvels. And they would believe and could understand nothing whatever that I told them. 
It was beyond my power to make them understand what sight and seeing really were. Finally, they began to explain the world to me. The world was first an empty hollow in the rocks, and then came first inanimate things without the gift of touch, and llamas and a few other creatures that had little sense, and then men, and then at last angels whom you can hear singing and making fluttering sounds, but whom no one can touch at all. Singing and fluttering? Oh, you mean the birds. Birds? Yes. There is no such word as birds. If you continue to talk nonsense... Oh, excuse me. You come among us when our people are sleeping, stumbling and uttering words of no meaning. People sleeping? But surely... You surely don't sleep during the daytime when it's light? Nonsense again? It's natural that people sleep when it is warm and get up to do their work when it is cold. Day and night. I never thought of it like that. Warm and cold. So your day is our night. It is obvious that you were created to learn from us and to serve the wisdom that we have acquired. The night is nearly over. Eat and sleep. And tomorrow we will try and teach you some wisdom and understanding. The exasperation of those first few days were almost more than I could bear. It was impossible to make them understand, to admit that I possessed any faculty that was denied to them. I spoke of the beauties of sight, of watching the mountains, of sky and sunrise, and they heard me with amused incredulity. To them there was no sky. Their valley was the entire world, walled in with the rocks from which sprang a cavernous roof, which they believed to be smooth and solid, from which dews and occasional avalanches descended. I was imprisoned with them in a kind of cosmic casserole. One day I could stand it no longer. You say that people who can see know what is happening a long way off. Yes, I can prove it to you. We're outside the village, aren't we? It's out of earshot. Well, not really. But I can see what is happening there. Now, if I tell you what I see, things that you can't hear at all, will you believe me then? Mm, perhaps. What are the elders doing? The elders? Yes, the elders of the village. What are they doing in their hut? But if they're in their hut, how can I see what they're doing? I can tell you what the people in the streets are doing. Oh, I can hear what they are doing. When we get a little closer, I can hear what the elders are doing as well. I don't have to go into the hut. I can hear through the walls. Can't you see through the walls? Of course I can't see through the walls. Nobody could. In fact, nobody can see. And don't walk on the grass. I can't stand it any longer. Put that spade down. What is Bogota doing? Why has he raised the spade over his head? He's behaving very oddly. Why has Bogota walked across the meadow and not gone by the path as he should have done? I'm going to do what I like in this valley. Do you hear? I'll do what I like and go where I like. Hold him, Brother Pedro. He's going to do something foolish. Bogota, put that spade down and come off the grass. I'll hit the first man who tries to touch me. I'll hurt you. I'll kill you. Leave me alone. Put that spade down. Hold him, Brother. No! I told you, didn't I? I can see you. I can hurt you. Now try and stop me. Try and find me. I shan't come back till you acknowledge me as your king. In the country of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Well, I'm better than that. I'll prove it to you. Try and find me now. <laughs> stayed outside the wall of the valley of the blind for two days and nights without food or shelter. I thought of ways of fighting and conquering these infuriating people, but there was clearly no way of doing so. I had no weapons, and though I could make myself a club from the bough of a tree, I knew that it was impossible for me to attack them singly and in cold blood. I tried to find food among the pines, even to catch a llama and kill it, but it was no use. Hunger proved too much for me. Until finally, I crawled back to the village to try and make my peace with them. I was mad, but I am only newly made. Forgive me. Huh. That is better, Bogota. Do you still have the foolish illusion that you can see, as you call it? Uh, no, no, that, that was all a mistake. The word means nothing. Yes, you are recovering your senses. And what is it that is overhead? Is it the sky, I think you call it? Uh, no, no, that, that was wrong too. About ten times the height of a man, there is a roof above the world, of rock, 
and very, very smooth. But before you ask me any more questions, give me some food or I shall die. Brother Pedro, give Bogota some llama milk and some bread. He's beginning to learn at last. I had expected dire punishment, but these people were capable of toleration. They regarded my rebellion as but one more proof of my general idiocy and inferiority. And after they had whipped me, they appointed me to do the simplest and heaviest work in the fields. And seeing no other way of living, I began to do as I was told. Time passed, and I began to regard myself by degrees as a citizen of the country of the blind, while the world beyond the mountains became gradually more and more remote and unreal. The man for whom I was put to work was called Jacob, the brother of Pedro, and his daughter was a young girl called Medina. She alone, of all the people in the village, listened to me kindly and tried to understand what I said. By degrees, we began to see more and more of each other. Or rather, I began to see more and more of her. You look very beautiful, Medina, sitting there spinning in the moonlight. You use so many strange words. It is hard for me to understand what you mean. Yet, yet you do, Medina, don't you? Sometimes. When you tell me about the moon and the stars and the sunlight and mountains, I try to imagine what the words could mean. You understand what beauty means? Yes. It means smooth. <laughs> you are beautiful, Medina. I am. Mm -hmm. But my face isn't smooth at all. Not nearly so smooth as some girls' faces are. <laughs> How can I be beautiful? You're beautiful to look at. Your eyes look as though you were sleeping only. They're not red and sunken like the eyes, the eyelids of the others. And you have beautiful long black lashes. You should not flatter me like this, Bogota. <laughs> it's not flattery, Medina. It's the truth. To me, you are the one beautiful girl in the valley. I love you. And I'm going to ask your father, Jacob, to let me marry you. Oh, no, Bogota. Yes. You yes. mustn't. My father will be terribly angry. What? You must promise not to, please. Why should he be angry? Don't you love me? A little? I like you very much. I am happy all the time we're together. But you behave so strangely. I cannot always understand you. I will teach you to understand, Medina. And I, I will try and teach you to understand. It was one of Medina's sisters who told old Jakob about our love. And her whole family were bitterly opposed to any idea of marriage. Not because they thought very much about her, but because they despised me so much. To them, I was a being apart, a serf, an idiot, an incompetent, clumsy thing below the permissible level of a man. I cannot give my consent. It is impossible. Bogota is but newly formed. He cannot become one of us, or any better than a menial, while he still has these strange delusions about sight and seeing. You must try and forget about him. Perhaps after a few years he may improve. We will think about it then, if you persist in your foolishness. We were both of us in despair, for Medina refused to go against her father's wishes even if it had been possible for us to escape from the village together. But there was nowhere else for us to go. The village was the whole world. Then one day, one of the elders had an idea. He was the greatest doctor in the valley, the medicine man. And he was renowned for his inventive and philosophical mind. The idea of curing me of my peculiarities appealed to him. One day, he broached the subject to Jacob. Your daughter still claims that she's in love with Bogota? Yes, though I have told her that the marriage is quite out of the question. Even if he could be cured of his peculiar ideas? But can he be? We have all tried hard enough. I've examined him, Jacob, and the case is now clearer to me. I think very probably he might be cured. I have always hoped that he could be. As we know, his brain is affected. Now, what is it that affects it? Ah, what indeed? This. 
those queer things that are called eyes, and which exist to make an agreeable, soft depression in the face, are diseased, in Bogota's case, in such a way that they affect his brain. They are greatly distended, he has eyelashes, and his eyelids move. Consequently, his brain is in a state of constant irritation and uh, distraction. Yes, yes. And uh, I think I may say with tolerable certainty that in order to cure him completely, all that we need to do is a simple and easy surgical operation, namely uh, to remove those irritant bodies. And then he will be sane? Then he will be perfectly sane and uh, quite an admirable citizen. <sighs> Thank heaven for science. Bogota, did you hear what Brother Doctor says? Yeah. Yes, it's outrageous. Monstrous suggestion. The doctor's out of his mind. One might think that you did not care for my daughter by the way you are behaving. Of course, the idea of losing my sight, of willingly surrendering the most precious of all gifts, was more than I could bear. I refused even to entertain the idea, to discuss it with Yakov or the doctor or the village elders, all of whom begged me to realize that their only wish was to help me, to make me as normal and blind as themselves. To them, the very idea of sight was meaningless. Never having enjoyed the blessing, they, they could regard it only as some disorder of the brain. It was Medina who persuaded me at last to reconsider the matter, for without her, my loneliness was even more bitter than blindness itself. Please, Bogota, for my sake, won't you at least discuss it with the doctor just once more? Medina, do you want me to lose it, my gift of sight? I do not want you to be unhappy, dearest. I can only make you understand. There are the beautiful things that I know so well. The beautiful little things. The flowers, the lichens among the rocks. The lightness and softness on a piece of fur. The far sky with its drifting down of clouds the sunsets and the stars. And there is you. For you alone, it is good to have sight, to see your sweet, serene face, your kindly lips, your dear, beautiful hands folded together. It is these eyes of mine that you won, these eyes that hold me to you, that these idiots seek to deprive me of. Instead of seeing you, I must touch you, hear you, imagine you, I must come under that roof of rock and stone and darkness, that horrible roof under which your own life is lived. Surely you wouldn't have me do that for no reason at all, but the ignorance and bigotry and prejudice of your people. I wish... Yes, Medina. I wish sometimes you would not talk like that. Like what? I don't understand. I know it's pretty. It's just your imagination. I love it, but now... Now? I mean... You mean... You think I should be better? Better, perhaps? Oh, Bogota. Yes. If I were to consent to this. Oh, if you would. If only you would. For a week before the operation that was to raise me from my servitude and inferiority to the level of a blind citizen, I knew nothing of sleep, of course. All through the warm, sunlit hours, while the others slumbered happily, I sat brooding or wandering aimlessly, trying to bring my mind to bear on my dilemma. I had given my answer, given my consent. Still, I was not sure. And at last, work time was over, the sun rose in splendor over the golden crests of the mountain, and my last day of vision began. I had a few minutes with Medina before she retired to sleep. My darling, tomorrow I shall see no more. Dear heart, they will hurt you very little. And you are going through this pain. You are going through it for me. Only that could make me submit to it at all. Dear, if a woman's heart and life can do it, I will repay you. My dearest one, my dearest one with the tender voice, I will repay You've never looked more beautiful than you do this minute, as the sun rises over the mountains behind you. Can you feel its warmth on your hair? Yes. It is getting late. I must go in to sleep. One last kiss, my darling. Goodbye.
Goodbye, my darling. Goodbye. I walked slowly down to a lonely place I knew, where the meadows were beautiful with white narcissus. There I would remain until the hour of sacrifice should come. Keep to the pathway, Bogota. Don't walk on the grass. I waited till the whole village was asleep, then stood there in the cool, moist grass to watch the morning. The morning like an angel in the golden armor marching down the steeps. And as I watched that blaze of light, it seemed to me that before such splendor, I and this blind world in the valley and my love and all were no more than a pit of sin. I did not turn aside as I'd meant to do, but went slowly on across the bridge, through the circling wall of the valley, and out upon the rocks. And my eyes were always upon the sunlit ice and snow above me. I saw their infinite beauty, and my imagination soared over them to the things beyond. I thought of that great free world I was parted from, the world that was still my own, and I saw in imagination those further slopes, distance beyond distance with Bogota, a place of multitudinous stirring beauty, a glory by day, a luminous mystery by night, a place of palaces and fountains and statues and white houses lying beautifully in the middle distance. And there, unpent by mountains, I saw the sky, not such a disc as one saw it there in the valley, but an arc of immeasurable blue. A deep of deeps in which the circling stars were floating. I glanced back at the village, then turned right round and regarded it steadfastly. I thought of Medina, and she had become small and remote. I turned again towards the mountain wall, down which the day had come to me. Then quietly and confidently, I began to climb. Next day I was high, but I had been higher. I had escaped forever from the Ballet of the Blind. This is Laurence Olivier again. I should like to extend, as usual, my thanks to our cast, who included this week Gabriel Blunt, Keith Pyatt, Stephen Jack, Donald Bissett, Anthony Carey, Roger Delgado, and Robert Rietti. Au revoir, and thank you. <laughs>